Welcome to the Music on the Mind series. My name is uh, Sandra Garrido and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow from the University of Melbourne. So I'm speaking to you this evening about why people listen to sad music. Well, happiness can be elusive, but it's, it's probably fair to say that most of us will spend a fair amount of our lives in pursuit of it. And it's something that uh, really takes up some of our lives every day. In other cultures, they may value things like um, conformity to group ideals or perhaps qualities like acceptance. But in Western cultures, at least, we could say that we're almost obsessed with the topic of happiness. Um, a quick search on the Amazon website came up with an astounding 66,000, more than 66,000 books with the word happiness in the title. And they come from all different fields. They're written by journalists, they're written by business people, psychologists, philosophers, and even the Dalai Lama. So we could say that in Western cultures, at least, we are obsessed with the topic of happiness. So given this preoccupation that we have with the topic of happiness, it's um, almost counterintuitive the fact that we, we seek out, we deliberately seek out things that make us sad. But we do it all the time. We may deliberately go and see a film that we've heard described as a tearjerker. We know it's going to make us cry, but we deliberately go and see it. With music, we may have a, a favourite love song that we play over and over. Of course, it's about love gone wrong. We play it over and over and over again, um, knowing that it's going to make us have a little cry. If there is any kind of a David Attenborough-like figure of the alien world watching human society, this would have to rate as amongst our most bizarre behaviours, the fact that the biggest thing we want in life is to be happy, and yet we deliberately seek out things that will make us sad, that will even make us cry. So why do we do it? Well, this is a question that has puzzled philosophers for centuries. Aristotle was the one who came up with the phrase, the paradox of tragedy. In Aristotle's time, of course, they used to have these uh, competitions, drama competitions, and they would have been held in theatres much like the one you see on the slide. They could hold around 12 to 17,000 people. So a lot of people would pack into these theatres to watch performances of, of tragedy, uh, largely. One of the most famous, of course, is the story of Oedipus. So I'm sure that a lot of you are familiar with that story. Um, he famously uh, killed his father and then married his mother of course, not knowing what it was that he was doing. And then at the end of the story, when he finds out what it is that he's done, he stabs his own eyes out and his wife slash mother commits suicide. And the, if you can picture this here in, in this Greek um, arena with 17, 20,000 people or something sitting there, the play ends with a Greek maxim being repeated three times by a chorus, which is that no man can be counted fortunate until he is dead. How depressing. <laughs> <laughs> but this play won, uh, it, was, it was written by Sophocles, it was a trilogy of plays, and it, it won the second prize uh, on its first performance in, in uh, the city where it was performed. And Aristotle described it as the greatest example of drama that was in existence. It's been replayed countless thousands of times since then. Um, it's been rewritten to fit modern settings. So it's definitely been a very successful play, even though um, it's so tragic. So why the popularity of this tragic tale? Well, Aristotle argued that tragedy allowed us a form of catharsis, or it allowed us to purge ourselves of negative emotions. Freud, of course, he claimed that it illustrated the universal desire to do, with, do away with one's father and possess one's mother. But as we know, um, it's not only the tale of Oedipus that has been so successful as a tragedy. So uh, Friedrich Nietzsche was interested in 
the whole reason that the Greeks would create a genre of tragedy. And he argued that, that tragedy illustrates the human condition. Tragedy is part of life, sadness is part of life. And so the beauty of the ancient Greek tragedies were that they looked unflinchingly at the reality of life. Well, was it just the ancient Greeks that loved tragedy? Definitely not. Coming to more modern times, the, if we um, adjust figures for inflation, still the greatest grossing film of all time was Gone with the Wind, yet another tragic tale from the 1930s. Coming up to more modern times, 1990s, we've got Titanic. And in real figures, this is the second biggest grossing film ever. I think it was something like uh, $2 billion internationally at the box office. So even today, um, tragedy is popular. What about music? Well, I'm sure that you'll recognize this song. Now this song, the Guinness World Book of Records from 2009 states that it's the biggest selling single worldwide of all time, having sold over 33 million copies worldwide. We'll listen to a little bit of it, and I hope it doesn't make you too sad. Any tears? So of course this song is famously associated with the death of Princess Diana. And it's an event that many people remember and think about when they, when they hear this music. And yet, it's been one of the, the greatest selling singles of all time. So it's obvious from this short discussion so far that our, our interest in sadness and our attraction to tragedy and to sadness are almost equal to our preoccupation with happiness. So the question is, why? Well. This is a, it's a paradox which has puzzled people for centuries. And the reason why is because sadness is by definition what we would call a negative emotion. This, um, on the slide you can see, this is what we call a circumplex model of emotion. So it, it uh, categorizes all different kinds of emotions according to two dimensions. One being the pleasantness or unpleasantness of the emotion, which we often call valence and the other being the intensity of the emotion or the, the uh, degree to which it, it makes us sort of awake, which we often call the arousal dimension. Now you can see where sadness sits in the bottom uh, left-hand corner quadrant. So it's, it's on the unpleasant side. It's a relatively sleepy, sort of low arousal type emotion, some, of, some people would say. Um, but it sits on the unpleasant side. Now to psychologists or... or uh, philosophers of emotion, negative emotions by definition are supposed to stimulate avoidance behaviours. So we avoid things that are unpleasant. So anything in that left-hand quadrant is supposedly going to stimulate avoidance behaviour. So if a person or, or a situation is upsetting to us, we avoid that person or that, that situation. But in the case of aesthetic things like music and films and literature, etc., we don't, as we know. So this is where the paradox comes from. So what are some of the possible reasons why we don't in these kinds of situations? Well, as I mentioned before, um, Aristotle proposed that it was uh, a form of catharsis. And a countless number of other philosophers have written about the topic. We can broadly categorise these theories into sort of three uh, broad groups. The emotivists and the cognitivists, they basically say, well, it doesn't fit our definition of emotion, therefore it must not be happening. There's something else happening. So the emotivists, for example, they say, well, the music makes us feel sad, but it's not real sadness. We have this special category of emotions called aesthetic emotions, which we only experience in the context of film or music and things like that. So they're saying we do feel sad, but it's not real sadness. The cognitivists say we don't experience sadness at all. We're mistaken if we think we're experiencing sadness. They say that all we feel is aesthetic awe or a kind of enjoyment of the beauty of the music. But we perceive that the music is expressing sadness and we mistakenly think that that's what we're feeling, whereas all we're really feeling is just an enjoyment of the beauty of the music. The functional explanations, um, 
to me, possibly carry a little more weight. These are the explanations that argue that there may be some reasons, some other reasons why some benefits that we get from listening to sad music, which make us put up with the possible unpleasantness of it. So that's uh, broadly what most of the explanations over the centuries um, fall into. But there are some problems and limitations with these explanations. So the cognitist and the emotivist explanations, they rely on contorting our story of what happens when we listen to music and, and twisting it around to make it fit definitions. They're also largely based on what we could call armchair theorising, so very little empirical study, um, but uh, mostly reflections on personal experience. And because they are mostly reflections on personal experience, they tend to fail to um, take into consideration the fact that maybe other people's experiences are different and that maybe there isn't one single reason that people listen to sad music or uh, one single effect that it will have on people. With the functional explanations, these are, are really quite, I've got a little friend here, um, quite um, logical explanations, but they don't explain, <laughs> sorry, they don't explain why we enjoy negative emotions. So they're, they're based on the premise that it's something that we're tolerating in order to get some benefit. We're tolerating the unpleasantness of it. And they don't really allow for situations in which we might actually enjoy the experience. And they also presume that you're only going to be attracted to sad music if you're under some kind of psychological pressure. So if you're undergoing difficulties, you might listen to sad music, but otherwise you probably wouldn't. So um, these theories have all been a very useful um, beginning point for looking at this paradox, but as we can see, there are some, some limitations to um, what they've been able to explain. Um, but if we go back to the words of Aristotle, he has amazingly picked up on some of these limitations uh, before these other theories were even written. So we'll just have a look at what he said and unpick it just a little bit. He says, feelings such as pity and fear, or again enthusiasm, exist very strongly in some souls and have more or less influence over all. Some persons fall into a religious frenzy, whom we see as a result of the sacred melodies, when they have used the melodies that excite the soul to mystic frenzy, restored as though they had found healing and purgation. Those who are influenced by pity or fear and every emotional nature must have a like experience. And others, insofar as each is susceptible to such emotions, and all are in a manner purged and their souls lightened and delighted. The purgative melodies likewise give an innocent pleasure to mankind. So the things that I get out of that, he's saying that there are differences in the degree to which people may need to be purged of negative emotions. He's also saying that there are differing degrees to which people can be influenced by music, differing degrees to which people are going to be touched by music and would be able to use that as a, as a purgative tool. And he also touches upon this innocent pleasure that we get from it. So to me, that suggests maybe something beyond um, benefits or uses or values, but just an innocent pleasure. Surprisingly, despite the fact that it, it seems rather obvious to me and, and possibly to you as well, um, the number of people that have discussed this topic over the centuries um, have sort of really failed to look at this idea of individual differences. So this is where my own research comes in. And um, in my approach to this topic, I had sort of three major theories that were my framework, I suppose. So the first was individual differences psychology, the, the premise that people are all different and that there may not be um, one single answer to this question because everybody experiences music differently and uses it differently and their response to music is different. Mood management theory um, is a theory that is often applied to uh, media of all sorts. And it, it has the basic assumption that people will always choose to engage with media that is going to help them to improve their mood if they're in a low mood, or it will help them to maintain a good mood if they're already in one. 
And the third theory that I was interested in is called the dissociation theory of aesthetic enjoyment. And that is the theory that in aesthetic contexts, maybe some people have the capacity to dissociate displeasure from the experience of sadness. So in using individual differences psychology, um, what that meant was that I was, I was going to be looking for a family of answers or a pattern of answers about why people would listen to sad music rather than one single answer. Um, mood management theory on its surface may seem to suggest that people would listen to happy music. And the evidence seems to indicate that oft, very often that is our first choice. But in an extension of that theory, um, we can, it can also suggest that maybe sometimes we'll postpone their desire for um, immediate happiness or pleasure in, in favour of long-term benefits. The third theory probably takes a little bit more explanation. So this is a theory that was proposed by uh, Emery Schubert of the University of New South Wales. When you hear the word dissociation, what might come to mind is um, what is experienced by many people who are victims of trauma. So for example, if people have had uh, an emotionally abusive childhood or gone through some other kind of trauma, they often experience um, forms of dissociation where they disconnect from reality. And it can be as extreme as those sort of um, multiple personality disorders that you see. So that's very extreme forms of dissociation. But in everyday life, we all do that, most of us, um, to a degree that's quite healthy, in fact, very useful. So daydreaming, for example, is a very useful form of dissociation, which has, is not pathological. It's something that we do, and it gives us a chance to have a little rest from the pressures of our daily life, and it's considered by psychologists to be quite a, a healthy practice. Absorption or flow, um, things similar to that where people become so, enga sorry, so engaged in whatever they're doing that they are completely unaware of the passage of time or of uh, the things going on around them. It's another form of dissociation which many people engage in and uh, which is quite normal and, and quite healthy. So what um, Schubert argued was that in aesthetic contexts where we realise that there's no real life implications for the emotions that we're experiencing, we're able to actually disconnect that displeasure aspect of sadness. So we just enjoy the emotional arousal of it. If you think back to those two dimensions of emotion, it's like we disconnect the displeasure and we're just enjoying the emotional arousal of it without actually experiencing the displeasure that we would feel if it was something that was occurring in real life. So um, with these ideas in mind, I began a series of, of studies and started off basically just by asking people how they listen to sad music, why they listen to it, and looking at some of these uh, particular personality traits. So in an initial study, we conducted an online survey and we asked people about how much they liked sad music. What we found was that there was a strong correlation between people's scores in absorption and their liking for sad music. So that tended to lend some support to that theory of dissociation, aesthetic dissociation. So that people that have a strong capacity to disconnect from reality tend to enjoy or be attracted to sad music more than other people. So that was an interesting starting point. But if it was just related to this personality trait, then you would expect how much you like sad music to be fairly stable from day to day. But as you know, some days we may feel like listening to a piece of sad music and other days we don't want to. So there's obviously more involved and we thought it may have something to do with mood um, or possibly interactions with other personality traits. So at this point we conducted some case studies where we interviewed people extensively about the ways they used music and the reason they listened to music in general. Um, and we spoke to them about why they listen to sad music. We also had a, a live listening experience as well. So we asked them to bring along a piece of music that made them sad, to listen to it within the context of, of the experiment. And then we spoke to them about their reactions to that. Um, the column on the right hand side has what people said about listening to music, to sad music. Um, so they did say that 
enabled them to um, purge themselves. It, it was a, an opportunity for catharsis. Some people said it gave them a sense of company and misery or a feeling that they weren't alone in their feelings of sadness, that there was some kind of um, person behind the music, whether it be the composer or, or the performer, and that they felt that they were, they felt somehow comforted in the idea that somebody else was experiencing what they had experienced. Other people said that it was when the music resolved happily that that had enabled them to get some sense of hope in the middle of sad emotions they might have been experiencing. Other people seemed to just enjoy the music. Um, and for other people, it was an opportunity to, to think about things that had been happening in their life, to have a little, take a little nostalgic trip back into the past or to, to grieve over things. But there was one participant who seemed to sort of break the mould here. And this participant um, had suffered from clinical depression and he described himself as um, listening to a particular form of sad music and so, of course, I asked him, did he feel better when he listened to that music? And he said, no. So the obvious question then was, well, why do you do it if it doesn't make you feel better? And he said really that he didn't know and he used the word addiction, that it was almost like a, it was an addiction to him. He didn't, didn't understand why he did it, but he was always looking for the feeling that that music gave him. He was always looking for the feeling of melancholy. And so it was a daily thing for him to listen to this kind of music, even though it was making him feel quite bad. So um, we realised that there were probably even more variables involved. Um, so in a, a, an, a subsequent study, we conducted another survey, but we added in some extra measures. Um, now, some researchers called uh, uh, Trapnell and Campbell have published a very interesting personality measure where they distinguish between rumination and reflectiveness. So reflectiveness is a quite healthy trait. It's considered to be a very useful way of dealing with negative events or emotions where a person thinks deeply about what has happened to them and reflects on that, analyzes it, but they're able to work through their emotions and they're able to process them, perhaps um, reframe them in their mind or, you know, find the positive out of the negative or somehow think of some positive steps that they can be doing to alleviate the situation. So that's reflectiveness. Rumination, on the other hand, is strongly associated with clinical depression. It's highly predictive of clinical depression. And it's when a person gets stuck in negative thoughts. So it can start out as the same process as a reflective person, but it's often, some researchers say, a largely involuntary thing where the person just gets stuck in a pattern of negative emotions and there's no moving through them, there's no moving on like there is with reflective people. And so the research indicates that this is actually quite harmful for people with depression. It worsens their mood and, um, you know, overall doesn't have a, a healthy effect on their, on their mental health. So these were measures that we added in to our study. And what we found was, again, confirmation for absorption, that some people with high scores and absorption were able to just enjoy the emotional journey of the music and, and there wasn't really much else to it for them. They just enjoyed it. For people with high scores and reflectiveness, they seemed to be actually using the music as a tool for processing negative emotions they were going through, for grieving about things, getting emotions off their chest. So all of those sort of functional explanations, they tended to be the things that reflective people were looking for when they listened to sad music. But people with rumination um, didn't seem to enjoy sad music so much didn't really enjoy the overall experience, but they believed that it was helping them. Now, when you look at the um, overall literature on this, on this ruminative coping style, it suggests that, that that's generally what people do with ruminative behaviour. They very often think that it's benefiting them and argue that it's benefiting them, whereas in actual fact it's not. So, for example, in this study by Papa Georges and Wells, the participants in their study, despite the negative consequences to their mood, believed that this ruminative thinking was going to help them 
to not make the same mistakes again in the future. Um, Watkins and Barraquet have found that people gave all sorts of reasons for engaging in ruminative behaviour. Um, they said it increased their self-awareness, their ability to problem solve or prevent future problems. And the stronger their belief in these positive effects, the more likely they were to be engaging in ruminative behaviour, despite the fact that it wasn't actually helping them. So that was remarkably similar to what we were finding with some of the participants when they were listening to sad music. They were saying things like it was helping them to get negative emotions off their chest, or it was giving them a feeling of being understood in the music, all sorts of things like that. So in the next series of studies, we were then interested in finding out, well, does sad music actually give people the benefits that they say it does? Are they actually benefiting from it in the way that they intend to? And is there any differences between people who are ruminators or, or other people in terms of the benefits that they're able to get? And we're all also interested in to what extent are people actually able to perceive the effect that the music is having on them? So um, over two studies, we had more than 500 participants. And what we asked them to do was to um, listen to a piece of music that made them sad, a piece that they chose that they liked, which made them feel sad, and a piece of music that made them feel happy. And we took their mood scores before listening to the music, after they listened to the sad music, and then after they listened to the happy music again. What we found was that people with high scores in rumination predicted that they were going to benefit from listening to sad music, but the mood scores showed differently. So looking at that diagram, the broken line is the people with low scores in rumination, and the, the bold line at the top is people with high scores in rumination. So you can see the people with low scores in rumination, the, the, um, the uh, left-hand axis is uh, depression scores, so the higher an individual sitting on that, the higher their levels of depression. So the low ruminators start off the experiment in, uh, with much lower levels of depression, quite, quite normal mood levels, really. People with high levels in depression start the experiment feeling much worse. And after listening to sad music, everybody's mood has deteriorated. Everybody's depression levels has deteriorated a little, but significantly more for the ruminators. So everybody seems to feel a little sadder after listening to sad music, but it's a particularly significant shift for people who are ruminators. And then when we asked people after they'd listened to the sad music, how had it made them feel? We asked them to predict how it would make them feel, and they all said it would make them feel better. We asked them afterwards, how did it make you feel? And despite the graph, despite the mood scores, a large number still said it had made them feel better. Um, and then after they listened to the happy music, another interesting thing happened. Um, in this diagram, the blue line is the low ruminators, the red line is the, the high ruminators. So after they listened to the happy music, the people with high scores in depression, their mood, their depression levels came right back almost to the level of people that weren't depressed before the experiment. So it really had quite a positive effect on these people that were prone to depression, um, despite the fact that some of them argued that they had benefited from listening to the sad music, whereas um, you know, they obviously hadn't all done so. So that indicates that we, there are a large number of variables involved in why we listen to sad music and the effect that it has on us. It can have to do with our mental health status, our personality. Um, people may have our, uh, all sorts of different goals when they're listening to music. They may um, just want to listen to it for distraction, they may listen to it for relaxation, they may use it to reflect on things that they're going through, um, they may just want to enjoy the emotional journey or the, the emotional arousal of it, they may want to use it as an opportunity for, ca of, for catharsis to get rid of some negative emotions they're experiencing. But the actual outcomes can be quite different to the goals. For some people, quite a positive outcome from listening to sad music. It can help them to resolve things that they're going through, or it can just make them feel good because they just enjoy the music. But for other people, and particularly people who might be prone to mood disorders, which are characterized by um, impaired abilities to, to regulate moods effectively, the outcomes might not be quite so good. So 
it looks like really um, thousands of years ago, Aristotle was amazingly astute in um, his perceptions about why we listen to sad music. And we've sort of almost come full circle now through all of these other years of, of theories. And we've come back to what Aristotle said. We know that for some people, catharsis is a big part of it and it's quite beneficial. Um, but it's not like that for everybody. And some people really just are able to enjoy the innocent pleasure, as, as Aristotle said, of the beautiful music, because you know, very often sad music is, is really quite beautiful. Of course, this knowledge has implications for health professionals and counsellors and things like that in, in being able to help people to make um, good judgments about the way they're using music in their lives, um, but also just for, for all of us in everyday life. I think a, um, music is such a big part of our lives. I think for adolescents it's somewhere between three and five hours a day that they may spend listening to music, and it has such a big effect on our emotions. So it's certainly a useful thing just for all of us. Next time we feel like, um, you know, watching that Cary Grant movie that's going to make us cry or... or um, you know, a good old Celine Dion or Whitney Houston song or something like that that we like to cry over, you know, to just think about whether or not which category we may fall into and whether or not um, it's something that we're benefiting from or not. But in any case, it certainly illustrates, once again, how powerful music is in moving our emotions. And um, it's, I think it's really a mystery that we will be continuing to research about, hopefully, for, for many years to come. So, do we have any questions? <laughs> oh, sorry, I think um, you're some, if you can, you're supposed to come forward to the microphone if that's okay. <laughs> Not to put anyone off. <laughs> I was wondering if this um, could also apply to people's addiction to um, criminal situations, you know, detective stories and all the violence that's associated with that. But it's because, I mean, they're a very popular genre. And one could also say the vampire movies, the end of the world, uh, you know, the American series, there seem to be tens of thousands of them now which are on, that have end of the world scenarios where everybody's been killed by vampires or... And yes. Choose your. So, is there any research yes. on that? We started off thinking that we were going to try and look at all sorts of different negative emotions, and uh, there was really just too much in it. So that's something for for future study. Um, we did find a little bit out about anger, and and I think that often. Um, for people who might listen to music that has a lot of anger in it, I think it's probably a very similar thing. For some people, it may be quite a useful way of uh, getting those emotions off their chest in appropriate, appropriate manner. But for other people who might be in certain mental health states, um, it could be the thing that actually triggers you know, possibly more violent behavior. So again, I, I tend to think, there's lots more research to be done on that, but I tend to think that it's possibly a similar thing, yeah. More questions? This, this may seem really obvious, but I'm just wondering, I mean, is there an accepted definition of what is sad, or is it purely an individual interpretation? And I, and I guess I'm thinking particularly, say, of classical music, where there is nothing visual and there's nothing spoken. Yes. Um, I don't know that there's an accepted definition that I would put it that strongly. I mean, there are certain things that we tend to associate with sad music, like slow, uh, slow tempos and minor keys and things like that. But just about anything can be sad for for anybody. So, you know, for example, that that um, "Candle in the Wind" thing by Elton John. I think I think it's in a major key, you know, but but it's fairly slow. And because of its association with a tragic event and a tragic story, for many people it's, it is a real tearjerker. So, I mean, there could be a quite up-tempo, very, very happy sounding piece of music that's happy to many people, but if it's associated with sad memories or something like that, 
um, for one individual. That might be a sad song for that person. So in all of these studies, that's why we ask people to select a piece of music that made them sad rather than us playing them something we thought was sad. We just ask them about you know, music that li they listened to that made them sad and left it up to them what kind of music that was. Yeah, interesting question. Any more questions or comments? Were surprised with any of their choices? Um, and that's a very subjective judgment. But... Yeah. Oh, yeah, there were pieces of music, like for example, classical pieces that to me are just beautiful. Um, but other people said were sad. And then you got some that are uh, like some heavy metal pieces or something like that that people were nominating and I couldn't see anything sad in, in that. It was very sort of high energy kind of stuff. So it's obviously a very personal thing. It can depend on the type of genre that people are attracted to normally, um, you know, what, what sort of memories they're associating with that music. So, yeah, very broad. Any more questions or comments? No? <laughs> Last chance? Yes, Carrie. Okay. Um, well, I guess I'm interested in the therapeutic application of this research. And so one of the dilemmas that there is is that so we, it's the, the data seems to be indicating that when you feel sad, um, especially if you've got a tendency to depression, a good thing to do is listen to some happy music. But in general, that's not what you want to do when you feel like that. So this is the, this is the dilemma. So, um, you know, a further step that I would like to look at is to what degree are people with depression able to become aware of how they're using music and able to change their habits if they are um, using music ineffectively and then just uh, how can we utilize it more in everyday life so as to to maximize our potential for happiness i suppose so yeah yes i know you identified at the beginning that this was a western kind of thing mm. but um i'm thinking south america and i'm thinking there's, there's other cultural aspects yes this. if you look at samba and tango for example there's a happy Sort of that. Well, that's another very interesting question that I dearly love to sink my teeth into. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, the uh, Latin American music fascinates me as well. My husband's Chilean, so <laughs> um, like the tango, most people in Western cultures associate that with <coughs> dance music, party music, but it's all about prostitutes being murdered and things like that, the lyrics. So, you know, really quite tragic there. And it does seem to me, just on a surface glance at it, that there do seem to be some cultures that are particularly attracted to sad music, perhaps more than others. Um, I recently was contacted by an Iranian researcher who's looking into that in Iranian music, um, their attraction to sadness, and he thinks that it's particularly strong in their culture. So, you know, it may have to do something with um, the amount of, you know, historical cultural memories for tragedies and, and dealing with that on a sort of a, a community global level. So yeah, that's another interesting direction to go in, yeah. And there was yeah, another hand up the back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you could, thank you. You talked about the three traits, the absorption, reflectiveness and rumination. What about the group of people who supposedly don't have an emotional reaction to music? Music doesn't interest them and therefore there's no interest there, presumably no reaction. Um, I think you have possibly answered your own question that maybe there's no reaction. <laughs> um, I, I don't know that people like that would really think that music was such an important part of their lives. Um, I don't, it's not something that I've looked into so I can't, can't state that authoritatively, but for the most part, people seem to be attracted to music largely because of the emotional journey, whether it be actually, you know, experiencing happiness or sadness or, or just enjoying the, the ups and downs in the music. For, you know, the vast majority of people, it touches us emotionally and that's why we listen to it. So I think um, for people who don't have that response, 
maybe music is probably not such a big part of their lives and they would obviously use other things to regulate their moods, I would think. Does that fit in with your yeah, thoughts? Yeah, I was wondering if you could learn anything from those people. Oh, right, yeah. Yes, well, I mean, very often, so for example, with things like autism, um, people like that tend to, may still love music, but for different reasons. So they may be more attracted to the structure of the music and things like that, rather than actually having an emotional response to it. So I think um, that often, you know, whether it's sad or it's happy music probably wouldn't really play a role in whether they like it for those people. Yeah. And I remember another hand, yeah. Um, yes, I think so, yes. And that, that is something that's been proposed by um, some philosophers uh, over the years, that it's a sort of an exercise of our emotions that, you know, that as humans we just need to exercise all of the possible human emotions. Um, so, yeah, and I think that possibly with reflective people maybe that could sort of be what it is. I mean, so, for example, teenagers, doesn't matter whether they've had a happy childhood or a sad childhood or, or are currently having a good time or not, um, they do very often seem to listen to a lot of sad music. They're definitely attracted to music a lot. So yeah, that definitely is a possibility. Mm. And there was one more hand, I think, yeah. If I could uh, pose a, a double-handed here. Uh, the, the theory of framework that I've been exploring is that if meaning-making, that, okay. that the function of, of listening to music um, is to stimulate us to create meaning that's, that's, uh, that meets some of our personal needs. And so it has very diverse and sometimes complex and overlap, uh, ambivalent functions, um, but it's fundamentally about meaning making. I'd like to point on that. And one of the uh, illustrations of that, it seems to me, is that uh, rather than see happy versus sad as a, a simple <coughs> dichotomy, um, that one can experience music uh, in ambivalent ways. Uh, a single piece of music can hold um, ambivalent, it can elicit ambivalent feelings. And some of the research, the empirical research, indicates that people can respond with both this is sad and this is, and this is happy. Um, I'm, I'm feeling both emotions. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and we did get that from some of our participants as well who mentioned that they, were, uh, they felt they were experiencing both emotions. So yeah, quite quite right um, in that comment that that um, we can't always understand. You know, it's a fairly simplistic view of emotion anyway to say that sadness is at one end and happiness is at the other end. You know, they can occur simultaneously even. So yeah, quite rightly. And I think that's another mystery to be teased out in this context. Um, in relation to meaning making, I think, yeah, definitely that's very relevant. And I think that maybe that's partly what reflective people are doing. Uh, using it as an opportunity to sort of, um, yeah, make make meaning of events in their lives, or um, you know, uh, create a, a narrative in their head of the way the way things have happened to them, and so music can sort of give them the opportunity to do that. Perhaps ruminators are also uh, um, attempting to do that. But yes. Yes, yes. As I said, I mean, it starts off much the same. The, the thing is that for some people, they are able to go through it. And so, you know, really for an individual thinking, oh, which one am I, can be um, quite a tricky thing to, to tease out, I think. But just that at some point, there should be um, a moving on, <laughs> I suppose. Yeah. Do we have any more questions? I think we're nearly ready to wrap up. So, good. Thank you very much for attending.